This is Barrels and Barrels, a bourbon and baseball podcast with your hosts, Brandon Spinner and Michael Burns. And welcome into Barrels and Barrels, a bourbon and baseball podcast. I am Brandon Spinner alongside my buddy, Michael Burns. Mikey, happy 4th of July. It's July 5th as we're recording, but hey, how was your holiday, dude? Hey, I enjoyed it. We uh, didn't have terrible weather aside from scattered thunderstorms that uh, just nor- we just missed some hail north of us, some winds. All right up your alley, buddy, right? <laughs> yeah, you got my <laughs> weather juices going. But do anything fun? Have any people over? Uh, we didn't the 4th, but for the 4th, I smoked a 9-pound Boston butt. I thought you were going to say out. you smoked your first cigar. <laughs> no. Um, butt turned out great. Boston butt. I started cool. it at 9.30 July 3rd, and it finished at 3.30 July 4th. Oh, so, 9.30 p.m. or 9.30 a.m.? P.m. Okay. So, so I started at night and let it go through the night. Yeah. And Michael sent me pictures of his butt. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Going <Joe> forward, <laughs> <laughs> this is Barrels and Barrels, a bourbon and baseball podcast combining two of America's greatest things, bourbon and baseball, two of America's greatest pastimes. And we have been starting our episodes out with the last couple of weeks of who is the best to wear the episode number, and this is episode 32. So, Michael Burns, have you done any research on who the best number 32 to ever wear the number is? Man, you saw me. I was making some graphics for us. I was was ahead of the game here, and I still didn't do this. Uh, Every week, without fail, without fail. It's like I don't read the very top of the agenda, and I skip right past the bourbon part because I don't, you know, and I see what's what. All right. So here we go. I am going to say this probably is a no-brainer. There are several players who have worn it for decades at a time, but I think there's one player that sticks out, and I think it might be a slam dunk. Uh, Steve Carlton wore the number for 23 years. No other player wore the number 32 more. Uh, The closest was 14 years by Vern Law and Milt Pappas, former Cub. And then 13 years for Elston Howard and Dennis Martinez, who is a name. And then Roy Halladay at 11, Sandy Koufax at 12 years, Matt Wieters at 11 years. And uh, that's it when it comes to multiple years in the double digits. But, I mean, Steve Carlton has the biggest war amongst any of them, and it is not even close. This is one of the higher wars. Have we done someone with 100 war plus before? Uh, I f- Barry Bonds was, wasn't he? Yeah, I'm not sure, but this is a high war for a num- for a single number. Yeah, 23 years for Steve Carlton, a 90.2 war. The dude was pretty ridiculous. I think he was a nine-time All-Star. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to beat Steve Carlton here, buddy. No, no. Steve Carlton, uh, born in 1944. Lefty. Career- like you said, career 90.2. He had 329 wins to 244 losses with a career 3.22 ERA. 5,217 innings with 4,136 strikeouts. And he did it with the Cardinals, the Phillies, and then he moved on to the San Francisco Giants, the White Sox, the Cleveland Indians, and then the Minnesota Twins. So he kind of did the AL Central tour towards the end of his career in the late 80s. I believe I have a Steve Carlton autographed baseball. He's got four Cy Youngs. He was an all-star one, two, three, ten times in his career. He finished up uh, Cy Young third place as well as Cy Young fourth place additional two times. So I think it's a slam dunk here, buddy, that this is this is his award. Well, wow. yes. I never did not realize how good Steve Carlton was. These numbers of innings pitched and strikeouts. MLB 4,000 strikeout club. 4,000 strikeout club. Yeah, that's got to be very, very minimal, especially for the fact that uh, the 3,000 strikeout club is kind of the benchmark, and nowadays it might even be a little bit lower. Look at his 1972. 27 wins to 10 losses. The dude had 30 complete games, but only won 27. He had 30 complete games amongst his 41 starts. Only won 27 of those? Yeah. (laughs) 
1.97 ERA, 346 innings pitched. He struck out 310. He had an ERA plus of 182 and a FIP of 2.01. Strikeout to walk ratio that year was 3.56. Yeah, it's Steve Carlton. Yeah, can you get the, so Steve Carlton? There's four. There's three others in the four thousand plus club. Can you name the other three? Cy Young, Nolan Ryan, and is it a pitcher of our generation? Yes. Uh, Randy Johnson. Yes. So it's Nolan Ryan, Randy Johnson, and Roger Clemens. Roger Clemens. Okay, so Cy Young was not a part of that. Cy Young was not. Nolan Ryan's the only one with. With 5,000, 5, yeah, and it was almost 6,000. My yeah. goodness, and he never won a Cy Young, believe it or not, which is crazy. But he we'll get to that. Fights, though. He won a lot of fights, uh, and he struck out a lot. And he, he did pitch for like 800 years. But episode 32 is the Steve Carlton episode. Welcome in. If you're new to our podcast, as I mentioned earlier, we are Barrels and Barrels, a bourbon and baseball podcast where we talk high proof and high heat. We are on YouTube, and we have been exploding on YouTube as of late, up to 333 YouTube subscribers, which is up from 295 just five days ago. So uh, a great showing from all you YouTube listeners and joining in. Don't forget to follow us there if you haven't already. Hit the subscribe button if you're following in now for the first time. We have a lot of different videos, and starting this past Monday, we put out our weekly Top 10 Power Rankings, which is going to come out on every Monday from now on, YouTube exclusive. So if you want to check that out, go head on over to our YouTube page. Just search at Barrels N Barrels Pod. That's where you can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, on Twitter. We are at Barrels and Barrels, and I forgot to mention it last week, but we are now on TikTok as well at Barrels and Barrels Pod. So go find us there for some more videos. Don't forget, you can always find us wherever you stream your podcasts. We're on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google, uh, as well as Amazon, and I believe Stitcher for now, but Stitcher's going away here soon because they're yeah. shutting down their podcasting program. So find us wherever you stream your podcasts. Great thing. You can review us. You can rate us. We'd love you to do that. We'll read your review like we did last week with Trey, and we will... Also, we try to reach out any way we can to help you out and make this a better experience. We're up to 19 out of 19 five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. And now on Spotify, that number's up to 13 out of five-star reviews. So thank you to all of y'all who are doing that. And thank you to all of y'all who have purchased T-shirts. Big shout hey, out. Well yeah, a big shout out to Emily who posted us on the 4th of July wearing her t-shirt. I know Amanda and Derek were wearing hers and his this past weekend. Well, I saw them this weekend in Lexington and you can now buy it online. You don't have to reach out to us anymore. Go to Ooh. our Instagram page. We've got it in our link tree. Or if you just want to go straight to the website, type in our new friend. Not our new friend. They're an old friend. They've been making our t-shirts for a while, but we're now on the website cat over at charliemikeneverweekend.com so go check out charliemikeneverweekend.com uh it's a family of veterans uh who run this business so it's great it's local and michael and i are both wearing the t-shirts tonight they are some of the most comfortable t-shirts you're gonna wear i always right? make sure to wear it on a long like a day where i'm gonna get to wear it long i don't want to wear it like for an hour and then take it off you know if i'm just gonna wear it to the gym or something i always wear it i can wear it all day all day. I wear it sometimes multiple days in a row. It just sits there. And I'm like, I'm going to lounge in this. It's so comfy. Sometimes, it's, yeah, not the greatest smelling. But also, <laughs> if you're interested in glassware, we'll soon have a glassware order. But we need your help. We need you to head on over to our Instagram page and click the link in our bio. It's a link tree. And you need to choose which kind of glasses you would like. Would you like a wisdom glass like I'm holding here on YouTube? Would you like Glen Karen's or a two-ounce glass? We are hoping to put an order in by the middle of July. So if you're interested in that, we'd like your opinions just so we know which glass y'all prefer and which ones we should go ahead and order. So with that said, let's pour something in our glass, Mikey. Oh, yes, please. Let's go. So today, the whiskey of the week, it is a bourbon. We are going with... Still Austin Cask Strength Bourbon Whiskey out of Austin, Texas. This is Still Austin, the bourbon whiskey company. Uh, Nancy Fraley, you may know that name, big name in the whiskey community. She is the master blender, and uh, lead distiller is John Shreppel. Uh, 
is John Treppel. I hope I said that name correctly, Ooh. but uh, give that a little pour. I've got it in my Will Whiskey Whiskey Chronicles Wisdom glass. Uh, Man, right at the explosion of a nose there. Yeah, it's potent. And oh, I bet I do want to shout out Basement Rick House. Um, I listened to uh, a tasting or. When I, I, I'll tell the story here in a few minutes, but I went down to Lexington this past weekend and did a, uh, a tasting with uh, Basement Rick House. He used to work at Buffalo Trace. Great stuff there. He taught everybody how to nose the whiskey. He told us his background at Buffalo Trace, how in order to make it as a taster and as a worker, you had to pick out each different part of Buffalo Trace. He said you had to know which one was Eagle Rare. You had to know which one was Buffalo Trace by not only the nose, but the flavor in order to just get the job. So it was kind of cool. He said he, he kind of shot down my two nostril. I was going to ask, did you ask Uh, him about the two nostrils? Did he point that out? uh, He said you can do it, but um, the big thing is you're not the only one I've seen do it. So, so they said the more important thing is to put your full nose in and take an inhale through your mouth, but don't take an inhale through your nose, but inhale through your mouth. And it's going to help warm up your tongue and it's going to warm up your palate, but also you're going to get those flavors in your nose. So doing that right Without away, burn. yeah, it doesn't get the burn either. So what do you, man, I got like a spearmint right off the front. Like, oh, is that what you get? You get spearmint? I get the mint, but it's not what I get first. First I get like a, a cherry bomb. Cherry and spearmint are like the two that right off the bat, right right up front there's some oak to it too but that's not quite as strong but cherry and spearmint for sure this this smells like a cherry taffy to me like i could almost just picture chewing on a cherry like taffy right now after just after sniffing it like saltwater taffy or just like just like like a can just a candy not necessarily a i'm i'm going more for like a texture that i smell of cherry and it's it's a bold cherryness it's very bold. Um, it's hot up front. I mean, not hot, but like it, it punches you with that. You don't have to search for anything, right? Some of these times yeah. we put our nose in, we're like, I can't quite pick it out. Like that is right right in your face. Um, nose is great. As far as the mash bill on this puppy, Michael, this comes in at 70% white corn, 25% rye, 5% malted barley. This did win the 2022 Double gold at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Again, this oh, is coming from Nancy Fraley, Master Blender. Um, a quick story behind all of this. I went to that whiskey fest in Chicago, what was it, two weeks ago um, at Malloy's, mm, and yep. there was 50 different whiskeys to try. And I probably tried about 25 or 30. Uh, again, just a little quick sips, not, I'm talking 30 let's different go, whiskeys. Let's go. Um, and this is the bottle I walked away from, or walked away from it with. So, uh, still awesome. <laughs> and I've had it for two and a half weeks, and look where that bottle's at. So, I'm coming in with a, a pretty good taste on this and a pretty good thought on this. 118 proof. I'm not going to tell you the age until after we take our first sip. So, But it's in the notes. It's in the notes. But you never look at the notes. And I just <laughs> I look added at the, them. I don't look at the top... Of uh, what it says, Boar's the best player ever. I look through. If you fill in the mash bill and everything, I definitely look at that. I also did some looking at it before this, too, on their website. So this comes They're- in at least two years old. So they say that for every year in Texas, you should s- expect three to three and a half years in Kentucky. So of the heat. theoretically, this is supposed to hit like a seven-year whiskey. So we'll see. I just took a sip. I get some oak right up the front, but also some cherry, and I still pull uh, a decent amount of that uh, spearmint right off the the tip. Wow, this is my first sip. This is fantastic. Yeah, I didn't get any bite. It was it was smooth. It was fruity. It was oaky. It was vanilla. And that was another thing from the basement Rick House. They said to take a quick sip, swallow, and then take an immediate sip right after. And chew on it, and that's where you're gonna get your best tasting notes. I really like that. Yeah, I really like that nose tip there to breathe through your mouth and not your nose. Just doing it one way and then the other, you definitely get more. You get it, it smells like alcohol. Like, 
I got a new bourbon earlier this week, I think Monday, and I thought it smelled great. And I was like, went to my wife and was like, here, Angie, uh, smell this. <laughs> I, sm- I think it smells fantastic. She smelled it and kind of was looking at me like, he... I was like, it smells like alcohol, doesn't it? She goes, yes. <laughs> it always seems to, right? Well, at least with Angie. No, no disrespect to Angie, but she's she doesn't drink them all the time either. She's no, not she's into that, it like she, that. She'll get the palate. Like when we've done the lineup, she'll do that. But those, I think I think it helps to have somebody else, you know, yeah. reading off like different notes, and you can then pick it out if you're not really good at picking them out yourself. So, what do you think of the pour itself? Like, I got some brown sugar out of it. The more I, like, chewed on it in that Kentucky hug, it's more of a Texas hug right here in the middle. Uh, They said on – I've got the old statistic sheet from my guy Eric Mersch from uh, Still Austin. says, it's an act of masterful artistry. Our distillers were able to combine power and subtly into one gorgeous spirit of velvet glove – meeting an iron fist so i think that iron fist is kind of that 118 proof i don't think it hits like a 118 proofer i can tell it's got some heat to it but i wouldn't say it's up there near 120 i would say probably closer to 110 and that's what i thought when i tasted it the first time but as you give that a swig like i've got cherry i've got that mint i got everything in the nose on the palate and usually sometimes that doesn't work that way i also got some of the oak and the wood um i do get a little brown sugar but those are probably the four main notes i've got yeah i don't feel like it's there's a burn but it's not an it's actually not a burn it's the mint coming through Mm -hmm. that is like when you chew over a mint gum right like Mm -hmm. where is that bad or overpowering for you no um it is um when i tried doing the quick sip i think i've taken a sip too much and i've got to let it linger a little while but that mint is what you feel on the tip of my tongue. Um, yeah. It's definitely unique. It's not like uh, when you get mint, sometimes I get turned off by the mint. Right? Like when I've had some new riff and some of the new riff I don't like is when it's very spearminty. I think this is a good balance between the minty and even like a caramel oaky and even some cherry to it. I overall enjoy this pour. I think the finish has a little more of that rye to it, but even it's like the 25% rye still doesn't even come through as 25% rye. Like I would have expected it to be even lower in a mash when I look at it. I can pull that rye out and that, you know, if you try to think about, think about the different aspects of this thing, mm-hmm. the rye flavor is definitely there. If you, if you look for it, um, it's not overpowering at all. This is, I liked that description of velvety. Mm hmm. It, it could mouth be feel. Because, yes, because you drink it, you get that ch- that fruit cherry up front, and followed by the mint. That oak comes in with the mint a little bit, and then lingers out into uh, a sweet, uh, almost like a buffalo trace finish. You know what I'm saying when I say that? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, Michael Burns, where do you rate this Texas bourbon whiskey on our barrels and barrels of bourbon and baseball podcast rating scale? Yeah, I think I've had two other Texas bourbons or whiskeys and thought they were nasty. So hearing this was from Texas, I was sweating a little bit like, <laughs> do I need, am I going to be sending another one packing? Oh, no. <laughs> but no, this is delicious. Um, right off the nose is an explosion. The palate is good. The finish is good. Here, I'm a, I mean, this guy is an easy all-star for me. Um, this is not something I'm going to go to every day, but this is an all-star for me. Oh my God. I almost sent this to you as a blind because I was scared you're going to have the Texas bias behind it. But I was like, I don't know. Mikey's probably going to crap all over this one. But for (laughs) those of you new to our podcast, we rate our whiskey on a baseball rating scale. Starting at the top is a Hall of Famer. That's the best in the game, right? 1% of Major League Baseball players make it to the Hall of Fame. Most of that whiskey. It's not going to be the best whiskey in the world, but the ones that are the best, they're the one percenters, right? We haven't ranked anything there yet. Next is what Michael just ranked his, an all-star. That is the best player on the team. That's one of the best bottles on your shelf. As he mentioned, it may not be something you're going to every day, but you're definitely going to want the bottle of this on your shelf. Next is everyday player. Everyday player is one of those players that's constantly in your lineup. You can rely on it day in and day out. May not be all-star quality, but it's one of those guys that you know, you put them in the lineup and you expect greatness most of the time. 
And then we go to the bench. Bench isn't necessarily a knock, but it's one of those players who comes in and mixes things up. You're not going to go to the same bottle over and over again. Maybe you need a pinch hit on a baseball game or a pinch hit on your whiskey shelf. That's one of those that, hey, I'm feeling this today. It mixes it up. It has different flavors. A dessert bourbon, you know, one of those peanut. If you if you like those peanut butter whiskeys, then yeah, hey, that's that's good to go to every now and then. <laughs> Not for me, but hey, that's what the bench player kind of is. Something flavor. Yeah, mix up the flavor. Maybe just mix up your palate. Maybe go to a wheat or bourbon compared to a high rye or something along those lines. Maybe just something to change the pace, just like a spot starter. And then finally, I thought this is the route Michael may have taken as I first sent him this sample. But DFA, designate for assignment, which means you're cut from the team. And Michael has been known to have a pretty decent year off the team. I've DFA'd, I believe, one or two. But I didn't give you my ranking. I'm going to go with an everyday player. So, Michael, you just rated a whiskey bourbon higher than me, which is not not happen a lot. <laughs> No, this was a. I th- I think what was what was missing from this is the rye was a little strong for a smooth bourbon for me to make it better. Um, but otherwise, I loved the nose, that cherry up front, that flavor. Um, yeah. But the rye, the rye hit. You know, as soon as I started taking bigger gulps, that's what um, drops it down for me to an all star. But hey, All Star, you say drop it down. But like, in order to make Hall of Fame, we haven't ranked one of those yet. And the fact that you have this at All Star, high praise. I'm glad I bought this bottle. That's for sure. Everyday player. If I see Still Austin, uh, which is pretty decently priced too, forty nine ninety nine MSRP for a cask strength whiskey. Again, Even it's only better. if it's only two years, but. Uh, it tastes older than that, doesn't it? You would say if I didn't tell you the two years, would you have what? What would you have expected? Four to five. Uh, four, four to six. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they said, right? Right on the label. Every 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 year in in Texas, multiplied by what? What they say two. Uh, Eric told me while I was tasting it, three to three and a half. So it should every be around. Year is three to three and a half. Yeah. So, so yeah. a three. So three year would be around a ten year, in Kentucky standards. So this is about a six year. Yeah, so this is about a six or a seven. Three, three and a half. So two times three and a half would be seven if we're going to do math correctly. So So what's missing from this to get you to the next level? I think there's just a little too much spearmint for me. I like the mint, and I think it's balanced. like the double mint twins? No. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's a call back to our our child days of uh, marketing with the double mint twins. We aged ourselves there. I don't need to put explicit for that, do I? No. No, okay. that, no, not at all. No, no. <laughs> it was that was an uh, ad on national TV. We're, I will, we're safe. Yeah, I will say this nose. I think the nose is better than the palate for me, but that nose is so great. Like I think it the is. nose is the best part of this, and it's not like the palate is bad. It's just it's it's hard to live up to that nose. And if you if you nosed this, you would know what we're talking about. You would know what I was talking about. Oh, hey, you. Brandon's got it tonight. Let's go. He's on fire. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, a big shout out uh, again. I want to thank Eric Mersh, who is the state manager in Illinois for Still Austin. We had a good chat. And that's why I ultimately walked away with this because he gave me a sample of this and the regular bourbon. And this, I mean, this is fantastic. I think I could, <laughs> like I said, I've downed about a third of this bottle, if not more, uh, in two and a half weeks. And normally it takes me a while. I find it funny because you'd almost told me to pick that up at Benny's Mm -hmm. uh, in April. Yeah, when you were back in Chicago. And and Star and said I went with a cigar cut old L. And you rated that a DFA, right? And I went with All-Star? Instead of the All-Star, yep. Oh, man. And I I spent double the cost. Yes, right? And that's another thing is you got to put the cost into the factor there too, but... Oh, great yeah. pour, great stuff, Nancy Fraley over there at Still Austin. Well done, and I'm looking forward to see what you guys continue to put out. 118 proof bourbon whiskey. And speaking of bourbon, I went to a bourbon trip in Lexington this past weekend at the Bourbon Ball, uh, run by another podcast, Bourbon with Friends podcast. Oh, we've got how far uh, Paul. is uh? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry, how far is Lexington from you? 
Lexington is about an hour and 25 to an hour and 35 minutes, depending on traffic. But Bourbon with Friends podcast, Paul, that's where he lives. Uh, But Paul and Connor run that podcast. It was for the Folds of Honor, who's the charity that was benefiting from the Bourbon Ball. But we did a two-day event, or at least it was two days for me. It was four or five days for some other people who are drunk. But <laughs> I can tell you, for me, two days was enough. Two days was yeah. enough. But but Friday, met some awesome people. We went to Castle and Key, did a VIP event there. Uh, got to do a lot more in-depth stuff at Castle and Key. Again, did that tasting with the basement Rick House. Uh, husband and wife duo, fantastic. Um, if you're ever up here, Michael, we may have to just go check out their basement and have a private tasting or something because it was uber cool to listen to them both talk about how he balances her out and vice versa. She has more of a palate. They, they say that women have a better palate in the whiskey yep. world. Uh, so we went and talked about that. We drank. We hung out with people. A lot of people in the whiskey community. I mean, Jesse, yeah, Michael, cool. uh, Amanda, Derek, Paul, Connor, uh, Megan, and Michael, uh, all the crew from the Outlanders with Friends prod- outlanders with friend podcast as well so it was a great time and then second night we went to the kentucky castle in versailles uh for the bourbon ball hung out with brian from tent mountain whiskey uh met a lot of cool people just had an overall all in all great time hung out with matt big whiskey so you know my favorite part was seeing the pictures of that is (laughs) seeing how tall everybody actually was yeah, because <laughs> you see the pictures. And everyone usually is just at a, a table pouring their bourbon if they're doing a yeah. video like that or a reel or something. And you finally all of a sudden see everybody standing together. And you're like, man, oh, either they're, they're man they're or, tall or yeah. man, that guy's actually pretty short. I tell you, Matt, big whiskey, big guy. <laughs> also, <laughs> so he can heavy do the chugs. Uh, and Heavy Bourbon was there. Dan Heavy Bourbon was there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all the big guns were out there. It was a great time. Uh, you're going to have to come up next year. We're going to have to go together, Michael. You're going to have yeah, to be my date. You said, uh, you said, I'll be your date. You said, uh, if I ever come up there. I'm just waiting for the invitation, baby. Oh, that invitation's been wide open since I moved here, pal. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, speaking of uh, invitation. I haven't been invited back to Alabama yet. But in Alabama, they're big Braves fans, and the Braves have been playing some of the best baseball in the game. And they're all being led by one of the best ball players out there, Ronald Acuna Jr., who just did something that has never been done before in baseball. And we'll get to that in a second. But he's got 40 stolen bases. He's actually up to 41 now. But our trivia question, and for those new to the podcast... We transition from bourbon to baseball with a baseball trivia question. So this week's trivia question, Michael. When was the last time a Braves player stole 70 bases, and who was it? I think I do, know this one. Do not look it up. I'm not looking it up. I'm going to go. I think I think it was our generation. Is it? Yes. It was Raphael Fracal. It was not. Oh, gosh. That dude, was, that dude had a cannon play, and, and had some wheels. He never even stole more than 60 bases for the Braves. The last time a player for the Braves stole 70 bases was Otis Nixon in 1991. So technically our generation, because I think that was the year you were born. But uh, Billy Hamilton, not the Billy Hamilton playing right now, but in 1896 stole 83. And the Braves record is King Kelly in 1887. All three of those numbers, uh, Otis Nixon stole 72. what year was the King Kelly? Uh, 1887. Oh, my gosh. He th- stole 84. And Acuna's got a chance. I think he's probably going to fall shy of that, but he's got a shot at 80. But insane numbers. But Otis Nixon, 1991, stole 72 bases. And I hope that Joe Campbell or S- Smooth or Kyle, one of our big Braves listeners, I hope you guys guessed that one. I wouldn't have expected Michael to get it, but I hope one of you three did. Do the stolen base trivia question there? Yeah. We've got some Braves diehards. Speaking of that, I'm going to have to change my hat. I might have thought Michael Bourne was up there. Uh, The one from the movies? No. (laughs) I know, not that Michael Bourne. For a second, I was like, wait, is that his name? I know his last name was Bourne. It was Michael. Yeah, it was Michael Michael Bourne. He was the uh, (laughs) outfielder who also played with the Astros, too, I believe. Is that Ronald Acuna Jr.? No, that's Michael Bourne. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's Michael Bourne. (laughs) 
And Michael Bourne was an outfielder for the Braves at one point. Their outfielder, right fielder nowadays, but he played center field as he was coming up as well. Ronald Cooney Jr. could be one of the best, if not the best players in baseball, if it wasn't for a name we'll get to here in just a few minutes. But uh, he just did something that has never been done before, Michael. With a stolen base the other night uh, in the game, it gave him 40. And he's the first player to have 20-plus home runs, 40 or more stolen bases, and 50-plus RBIs before the All-Star break. How insane is that? The dude is, is having an immaculate season right now. Just incredible season. Yeah, he's got a chance at a 40-40 year. Uh, he already hit the 40 mark on stolen bases, so he just needs to hit the home run point, and that's kind of where we're going to be close. He might get to 40 home runs. I think he's on pace for exactly 40 at this point in time. He's having a crazy year, and the, that entire team, I mean, there's no break in that lineup. No. They, right now, it does not seem like they can be stopped. I no, mean, I, the Marlins, who were hot. Was, yeah, the uh, Reds pulled one game out. Um, and all three games against the Reds were one game or one run games, but I mean the Braves still kind of manhandled them, if you think about it, right? All the props to the Reds; they were the only team that seemed to be competitive before uh, that matchup. But they had what eight games in a row, and now they've won. Where are they? Nine in a row. It's just every time they end a seven game, they win seven in a row, they lose. They win seven. In a row, it's and that is a. I mean, what's the record? Could just continue. They're they're hot right now. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of unfortunate that they're getting hot right before the All Star break. Well, they've been it's, hot for like a month and a half, <laughs> right? But you, you hope that the All Star break doesn't get guys out of their mojo a little bit, like the Cubs going to London kind of got yeah. them out of their mojo. Yeah, and that's a whole another story. But uh, the Braves were twenty one and four in the month of June. Twenty one and four, they didn't lose a single series. Uh, they w- ripped off like three straight. Winning streaks of like seven plus within three weeks. Oh, I know. I tried to jinx a couple of them and still didn't work. <laughs> uh, you got shadow banned by our buddy Joe because of that. But the Braves <laughs> went 21 and four. They scored uh, a ton of runs, 175 runs, which was more than any other team in baseball by a war- wide margin. 153 were the Reds in second place with that. They're pitching well. They're hitting well. I mean, all aspects of the game. What's their weakness? If you had to pick a weakness, is it the bullpen? Is it the starting pitching? I mean, they've been dealing with injuries, but I don't know. I don't know if you can find a weakness on that team right now. They are being carried. I think if it wasn't for Bryce Elder, they would be struggling starting pitching. But they've got the three, and they're going to get Max Fried back. They're doing right. all this without Max Fried, their ace. Mm-hmm. Which is um, ridiculous. Coming right. into yesterday, they were fifty-seven and twenty-seven. They did lose, so they're fifty-seven and twenty-eight coming into today. But they're beating the Guardians right now in the top of the seventh. So, man, destroying them. <laughs> Thirty games above five hundred, a six seventy-one winning percentage. And as you heard on our YouTube video earlier this week, they're our number one team in the power rankings, and for a good reason. Thirty and fifteen at home, dude. Jeez, twenty-seven. What was the Rays record in April? They won 14, went 14 and 0, but did they finish better than, you know, 21 and 4? Let me look it up. The Braves, the way that they're playing right now is insane. April record for the Tampa Bay Rays, of course, StatMuse isn't going to give it to me, but it looks like that they went like 20 and 2 or something like that. Hold on. Oh, so they did have less losses. But but looking at the Braves depth chart of rotation, if if they get freed back, they got freed a top would you put Freed as their number one or Strider? Freed. I'd say so, Freed. More proven for a longer period of time. So Freed, they've got an ace as a lefty. Strider, would, who would be an ace on any team, right-handed. So they've got an ace on the left, an ace on the right, and then good old Charlie Morton to be their three. With And then Bryce Elder's having a, a great rookie season as their four. That's He's all got the need. second best ERA in baseball. Right. Yeah, that's all you need. Yeah. Um, I guess their bullpen, AJ Minter, Nick Anderson, Kirby Yates, and then their close. I mean, wh- where's their whole? I, I, st- I think they could replace. They, they always, you know, like in 2021 when they won it, they traded for Solaire, Doc Peterson, and Eddie Rosario. Third, Eddie Rosario. They what did kind the of whole... outfield is that? What kind of outfield is that that you're going to trade for and then win the World Series? They made those guys. 
play at their best. And, and I think they were under 500 at that point, weren't they? They were. They were when they at the at the deadline. They were. Yeah, because they got Peterson during the All Star break. But uh, Acuna wins NL Player of the Week last week with an incredible week, and it was outdone by freaking Shohei. And we'll get to him here in a second. But uh, I mean, Acuna's week last week was ridiculous. Five home runs. One double. He had nine runs, seven RBI. I think he had four stolen bases last week. His on base percentage last week was 600. 600. The guy cannot be. And then his average in the last, I don't know about the, about the last week, but the last seven days, his average, not his on base percentage, his average was 550. <laughs> Ridiculous. OPS was 1.916. 1. 1.9? 1. 1.916. Yeah. That, that's incredible. Yeah. So he had the OPS of 1.916. That Braves team continues to roll. Uh, the AL player of the week, and we won't touch too much on this one, but of course, Domingo Herman was one of them. He threw the 25th perfect game ever in MLB history. Really the 24th, but it's the 25th for Tigers fans' purposes. All right. And then Shohei Otani, for the second time in three weeks, he just... I think last week was a quieter week than the week before, but that's just because the entire month of June was Otani month. Last week, six home runs, best in baseball, nine runs, best in baseball, I believe, seven RBIs, 533 OBP, a slugging percentage of 1.25, 1.783 OPS, and that got overshadowed by Ronald Acuna Jr., but still, like, Shohei month over there in the AL. Um, I did see, did you, do you know the latest on the news? I see he was pitching last night, July 4th and left with the trainer. Yeah. He left with a blister. So that's the okay. issue. He had the crack nail, which took him out of the start versus the white Sox a week and a half ago, where I guess that would have been a, last week. And then he came back in and hit a home run versus the white Sox after getting removed with a crack nail. And then yesterday he had a blister, which is why he got removed from his start. And it's going to keep him from pitching in the all-star game but he's still going to be the dh uh so i mean yeah he can't pitch in the all-star game but he's still going to be the dh the starting dh for the other like that's how good he is yeah. is he the best player that you've ever seen now like ever the i i almost think it doesn't even get enough attention i mean they get the wow he gets the wow factor but he still doesn't get enough attention I, of I, what he's doing on both sides of the plate i agree i mean He's an ultimate unicorn. And I know every week we've talked about him for the last three weeks. And it's not just to get clicks and views. Like, he is the greatest baseball player in the last three years combined, like more than any other player, like double the war. And he's I doing saw it. something. Oh. He's doing it on both sides. I saw something interesting. Someone said he needs two contracts as a pitcher and a hitter. Because you he jump won't jump into that. Someone, someone said. Someone's reasoning was he needs two contracts because he won't be able to pitch as long as he'll be able to hit. But it doesn't matter. You're paying for the player, right? It right. doesn't matter. So what? You're a, you're an owner. You're a GM. What are you paying him? He's a free agent in the off season. Go. What are your thoughts? Uh, I don't know that I would pay his price. That it's going to be. I saw someone say eleven years, five fifty. So I think that's, that's light. I think that's light. And that's exactly six, what someone else said. I think 650 is the floor. Oh my gosh. He's, he's 29 today. He right? turns 29 today. It's his 29th birthday. Aaron Judge is 31. He just got nine years, 360, which is 40 a year. So that's the bar for a hitter, right? For Otani. So 11 years at 40 is 440. What did Jacob DeGrom get? 185 over five years, right? Which is how much a year? It's around 35 a year. I think it's... But then Max and, Max and uh, Justin got 40-something a year, didn't 42 they? 42 to 43 a year, I believe. Shorter so, term, but... So say 35 a year as a pitcher, because he's a stud. He's a top 10 pitcher in baseball. And then 40 a year as a hitter. So you're talking $75 million a year. But I'm only giving him that ace pitcher for five years. Right? He's 29. Okay. So you he's 34. De detail his contract like that. Okay. Smart. Smart. But overall, you're working it in. But you're paying him right. for five years as a pitcher. That's what you know, buying him now. And then 11 years as a hitter overall. 
So I think you take, uh, what, five times 35 is the 180 or whatever, and then plus the 440. Quick math, we're looking at 635. You're going to have to bargain. You're going to have to fight against other teams. I say 650 is the low ball offer right now. For how many years, you think? 11 matter. years. That's the 650 11 over years. 11, maybe. I mean, sh- shoot. I bet it goes more than that because you Darvish has got a contract into his four, age 42 season. Okay, so do you give him 13 years at 65 a year? Do the quick math. That's more than 750 million. 13 times, that's 845 million. Right. So if you give him. Oh 13, my gosh. Yeah. How close is he to being a billion dollar man? I guarantee he's going to get more than 675. That's my thought. Is he's got he's got to be over 675. It's ridiculous. That's inc- I wonder imagine though if someone did just, you know what Otani, we're going to make you the billion dollar man, but it's going to be over 30 years. And Bobby They Bonilla could do and, that. Like, well, Ken Griffey Jr. is the third highest paid Cincinnati Red this year and he's 53. So I mean, Otani's, I think, though, of all players, I don't think he's going to go for the money. I think he's going to go where he wants to go, right? The team that he wants to play for is going to have the money for him, whether it's 600 to 700, right? I hope. I hope that be, that's the case because you see guys who go chasing after, Chris Bryant, no, chasing after the money, and it just <laughs> doesn't work out sometimes. Well, how amazing does Jed Hoyer look right now between Javi Baez Chris Bryant, Kyle Schwarber, and Anthony Rizzo. Do you know what you want to know what their combined war between the four of them is this year? Uh, this year is as of last Friday. Negative zero point four. It was point four. It was point four positive. I believe positive point four. Oh my god! Between the between the four of them, I could be wrong, and- but I heard it on the radio in ESPN Chicago. So yeah. Uh, going back to Shohei, uh, not to get off of him yet because I still want to continue to talk about this. The month of June, one of the greatest months as a batter that we've seen in a long time. Dude hit 15 home runs, 394, 492. Slugging was 952, Michael. OPS for the month of June, 1444. His WRC plus, weighted runs created For plus. 278. Do you want to know who came in second and what the number was? Uh, Ronald Cooney Jr. Corey Seager. Plus oh, 197. Wow. Yeah. Otani walked 16.7% of the time. And he, he the month he had of June was ridiculous. And that doesn't even take into the part of him, you know, actually being a number one or a number two pitcher in a rotation, which he did very well in the month of June. So I want to go back to Otani's contract. Okay. You've seen, you were talking about how much he costs, how much he's going to cost. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's a big deal, like paying a guy so much money, like the Bryce, like Bryce Harper. He, right. got, so he got a deal. But in, in 10 years, that's going to be nothing. $25 million is going to be nothing. Right. So I don't I don't hate these big deals for players if it's going to shut you down as a team so it's going like to the poor teams. See, but that's the thing. I think whoever signs him is going to be pulling in so much ad revenue, so much memorabilia rem- revenue. Like, think of okay, just throwing this out there. I would buy Cubs fan. Otani jersey. Are you buying a Cubs Otani fan? jersey? Right. Oh, absolutely. Hundred thousand Otani jerseys like that. Yeah. And that doesn't even include all the Japanese media. That's going to be putting in money like for to go watch an Angels game. The amount of Japanese companies that are sponsoring something in the ballpark, that's higher. So you're pulling in more money. You're pulling more eyeballs into your TV games. So you get to sell those commercials for a higher. You're not going to worry about being able to pay it. Now, if, if there's he a wants luxury to come tax, to you, you pay him. Right. So if he, I, I, if, 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 I think you throw an offer out there and if he wants to come to you, you pay him. From a so now what I want to talk about is a baseball perspective. I don't think it's a bad option. I mean, he fits 
a 26 man roster, he fits two positions in that. Even if he doesn't pitch after five years, he's still the best DH in the league. So what what I was going to say until you just kind of changed the pace with ad revenue and how much money he brings in to basically help pay for half his contract, if not more, mm-hmm. is look look how long he's been on the Angels and him and Mike Trout and have the Angels won a playoff game. No, but have they surrounded him with the correct talent? There's another thing there, too, is you're going to need to surround him with the correct talent overall. And like, the Angels just don't know how to do that. Last put 10 years. this out there. What number one pitcher did they get while he's been around? I can't tell you one. He They haven't gone out for the best pitcher on the market. The la- I think the last time they did that was C.J. Wilson. And, mm-hmm. the and he wasn't had a season. And he still wasn't a Verlander type guy. Right. They've never paid for pitching. They've only paid for hitting. And they paid for hitting on the wrong players. Anthony Rendon. They paid for mm. Albert Pujols. They put money out there on players like Justin Upton. Right? Like yep. players who were either past their prime, didn't deserve the money that they got. They just got it because they had a hot free agent year going into their free agent year. They've right. never paid for the pitcher. And this is just me as a Cub fan talking. You've got Justin Steele, who is pitching like an ace. We're watching him tonight. His ERA is down to 2.42, leads the major leagues. you got Marcus Stroman. If you re-sign him, that's a number three all of a sudden with Otani. Then you throw out Kyle Hendricks at a four, and you've got pitching. Drew Smiley has a five next year, and that's not if you have Cade Horton come up or Jordan Wicks or someone like Hayden Wesneski come in and actually be a number five starter. A five. Oh, five. Just come on, guys. Just give me a quality start, and that's all I care about. He makes the depth of that rotation better. This is probably the best Angels team that he's had put around him. Right <laughs> yeah, now. right. And it's it, they're five. I think I, I wonder when's the last time they've been uh, in second place in the division. You know, right? They haven't so, won a playoff game since I think two thousand thirteen or twelve. Oh, was it that long? Oh, 2000. I, don't, I don't think. No, no you're been. right. You're right. They haven't won one. They haven't been to a playoff game right. since Trout's then. played they in three been. total playoff games. They All haven't the won, I don't think, since uh, 0- 07 versus the White Sox. Or okay. 05 versus the White Sox. I don't know why I said 07. 0- 0- 05 versus the White Sox because that was when they lost uh, four games to one, and that was the whole A.J. Przinsky thing. But, yeah, it's it's been a long time since they've had success. I, I don't care what it costs. Get Otani because he makes your team instantly better. I don't think he brings the... I don't. You don't see it now, and he's the best player in the game. He's not going to bring that diva, look at me, look at me, look at me kind of thing, no matter what he's getting paid. He's still getting paid a pretty penny right now. Right. He's not He's not the type of guy, like you said, look at me, that he's um, – the example I'm going to give is Jazz Chisholm. Yep. I, think, I think the guy is too much look at, too much look at me. Uh, I think he's the most look at me kind of guy. Right. Um, Tim Anderson's another one. Mm-hmm. Ronald Acuna – He's a almost bit. there. He's almost there. Wander? I actually, uh, I don't see Wander enough. I don't watch Wander enough. The I don't watch the race. Flip the ball, grab and throw. Like, oh, yes. You know what I mean? Like the showboat. I don't think you see that out of Otani, and I don't think we're ever going to see that. And that's what I think makes him the complete ball player because he's a pitcher. He's a batter, but he's not an issue in the like off the field. right? He's not a head yeah. case. He's not something like that. I mean, we could talk about Otani all day long, and I'm sure there'd be a lot of people who would love to listen to that, but there's other teams that we've got to talk about. Before I get into that, the month of June he had was ridiculous. We didn't talk about his pitching performance in the month of June yet. In 30 innings, in five starts, he went 2-2. Two and two. He had a K per nine of 10.98, Michael, a war as a pitcher of .6, and that's on top of everything he did as a hitter with 15 home runs. That's why he's the ultimate unicorn. I got I, I if I could fundraise for him to bring him to the Cubs, I would. Is is he having a better career year or contract year than Judge did last year? Uh, I believe so. Let's look it up real quick. I mean, Judge, Judge had an immaculate contract year. 63 home runs? 62. And 62. Yep. And uh, bet on himself and won. And Otani, I don't know if he even bet on himself because he's been this type of player, but now... The home runs. The, I think. I think he's. He's never been. I'm not gonna say never been elite, but now he's among the elite. If you know what I mean. He's. He was always up. He was always up there, 
but now he is like if you were to name a top three hitter, he's there where I think he wasn't oh he wasn't there before. So in twenty twenty one, Shohei won the MVP. Eight point nine more. The second best was Zach Wheeler oh at seven point seven. Carlos Correa was seven point two. Last year Aaron Judge was a ten point six. Otani was a nine point six last year. My goodness. This year was- we're just past halfway. Otani's at six point three. <laughs> the next highest is Ronald Acuna at 4.9. He's 1.4 war higher than Ronald Acuna Jr., who is right now probably the unanimous MVP in the NL. So I would say this is probably going to be one of the best walk years. I'm looking at some other. I mean, Mookie Betts had a better year in 2018 than Judge did in 2022 just by B war. But, yeah, I uh, I mean, it's hard to beat what he's doing right now. Yeah. He's leading the league in home runs. Uh, And speaking of home run leaders, that's a name I want to bring up. Is yesterday, as you and I were talking, you realize that Luis Robert Jr. has the third most home runs in the majors this year? No, because I feel like he he can't be leading the league in something because he had spent some time on the IL. Always does. Always does, but he's been healthy this year. He's been sat for one game. He's played 84 games so far. He's got 25 bombs. That's tied for third with Pete Alonzo. Matt Olson is the only one higher than them uh, at 28. In the American League, it is Shohei, then Luis Robert, and then Mookie. Uh, Mookie's not in the AL anymore. Uh, then all the way down to Adelise Garcia at 21, uh, who's 10th in the league in home runs. But Shohei leads the league in that. He leads the league in RBI. Uh, or How actually, many does not Shohei anymore. have? 28? 31. Oh Shohei does not lead in RBI anymore. He did until Adelise is now at 69. Nice. Um, but nice. Shohei scored 61 runs. But like home runs here, we've got Shohei, Matt Olson, Luis Robert, Pete Alonso, Mookie Betts. Do you want to know who's in sixth? For home runs? Mm-hmm. There's a three-way tie for sixth place. Let's hear it. Ozzy Albies. At 22. What? Jorge Soler and Kyle Schwarber. Yes. Uh, Ozzy Albies. He leads all second basemen in home runs. Just think about like, That's what I was talking about with the Braves lineup. They've got, I believe, nine guys already at double-digit home runs are almost there. Michael Harris has nine, and I think he's at like the 10th highest on the team or something along those lines. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that's that Braves team. I don't. I think they could do the same type of thing in July. Okay, I was wrong there. I've got to stat correct myself. They currently have seven players in double digits already, but listen to this. Matt Olson, Ozzy Albies, and Acuna, all above 20. Marcel Ozuna from the Braves, 17. Austin Riley, 15. Eddie Rosario and Sean Murphy both have 14. Michael Harris has nine, and then you got Darno and Orlando Arcia at seven. And Pilar at six, who theoretically and could be. Arcia is the starting shortstop. Yeah, in the <laughs> National League All-Star team. Ridiculous. The Braves, I mean, whatever. We were going to talk about Otani's contract and the guy who I thought was going to be, who was talked about the biggest contract ever was going to be Juan Soto. Mm -hmm. He's still got two years, though. He's not a free agent until 24. And did you see what he said about Otani the other day? No. What did he say? I think it was Monday. He said something, and he's like, "But but he has to face us. I don't know the exact quote, but wait till he faces us. You know what happened in that game yesterday? Otani did leave with the blister, and I think they, the Padres got to him. Juan Soto, 0 for 2, two strikeouts. Man. And I don't think but Otani Juan, showboated it either. Like, just put him up, put him down. Not like not like Juan Soto does every at bat with his shuffle. Oh, right? Like, just, I mean, it's good. It's good. It's good fun. It's good fun and it's good uh, theater is the word I was looking for, but man, like bat, batting stance guy, you mm-hmm. know, who does all the different batting stances. Juan Soto is one that stands out, just like Nomar Garcia Parra, baby. You know, you oh, always yeah. get the batting gloves. Mm-hmm. You know who Juan Soto is. Yeah. So yesterday, the Padres did beat the Angels eight to five in Otani's start, so they did get to him. But still, like when it came to the Soto Otani matchup, zero for two. Two strikeouts. Now, Otani did go five innings, five earned runs, four walks, five strikeouts. He did give up two bombs. But still, I mean, hard to knock him when he's been the best player in the league by a large margin. And Juan Soto, 
shut up, sit down. Uh, but sitting Your down... Your team is how far below 500? Yeah, well below 500. 40 and 46. Uh, speaking of the Angels, Mike Trout, that's a huge blow to this team. He's out four to eight weeks. He had surgery today. Uh, oh. Hamate bone in his left hand. And hamate bones are hard to f- like come back from because it's your hand, right? It's how you grip the bat. It's a bone you don't really need in your hand. I think Albert Almora had this surgery back when he was in the minors with the Cubs, and that slowed him up. But four to eight weeks, Trout has had a rough year for his standards, but still a great year if you looked at the average ball player, right? You would take it. Um, you just wonder, Trout, he, you know, he for the last 10 years has been the, our, the greatest ball player of our, of our generation. And mm-hmm. now all of a sudden he's got, he's what, 30? He's in his 30s. Years old? I think he's 30s. 32 or 33. I think he's the same year as me when he was born. 31 years old. Okay, so August of 91. So he's your age. So you yeah. wonder, the, his his back issue he has to live with and mm-hmm. play with the rest of his career. Now this hey mate, I think that could really hurt the Angels who have to get in the playoffs in front of the Rangers and mm-hmm. all of a sudden they hot Astros. Mm-hmm. And all the other teams in the AL East. And all the other teams in the AL East. And if only they could be in the AL Central. <laughs> if they were in the AL Central, they'd be leading the AL Central. But yeah, Trout is out probably let's just say two months. I'm gonna I, I doubt he comes back fast. They're gonna take their time with him. As long as they're playing winning baseball. They may rush him back if they're starting to struggle and they need the wins. But uh, that's going to hurt them big time without him in the lineup. They have not played the best baseball as of late either. I think they've struggled in their last 10. You know, they're three and seven and they lost to the Padres last night. They've lost two in a row. They're only two games above 500 still six and a half back from Texas and four and a half back from Houston coming into tonight today. So oof. trout's out another LA team. They just put uh, their ACE on the IL. I.L. There you go. Gotcha. You paused for covered, a second. I covered it. Uh, the Dodgers. Clayton Kershaw. I wonder if they're doing this because it's going to get basically him some extra rest because of the the All Star game. Yeah, you hate to. It's usually Kershaw has back issues, but this is a shoulder. Mm-hmm. And I wonder issue. if he said sh- sore shoulder. So shoulder soreness. Did you realize where his ERA is at right now? Um. Did I see it earlier today? I know he's having one of the better years for his age. For <laughs> for his most age. recent years. Yeah. For most recent years is right. what I mean. He's got a two five five ERA, which is six best in the league. <laughs> but he just missed that top five there. Yeah. Just missed the top five. But like he's having a great year. He's having a great year. Uh, Dustin May just had a flexor tendon surgery, so there's two injuries, and we'll get to ERA leaders here in a second. But those are two injuries for the Dodgers, one that's out for the year, the other one that you would hope that Kershaw comes back from. I think he'll be back sooner rather than later. They mentioned that he'd be back after the All-Star break. Yeah, and I wonder if it was one of those, we're getting to the All-Star break. You're going to miss one start as it is. You're not going to pitch in the All-Star game, even if you make the All-Star game because of this. Let's just right. put you on the IL. It's what, 10 days now? So 10, day, 10 yep. days from Monday is the end of next week. And guess what? That's the end of the All-Star break. So I wonder if it was, let's get you to miss one start, be able to pull up a player onto our roster rather than just rest you for the week, get you healthy, and then have you come back. And the they, they have four other guys who can definitely right. um, fill that role. And I think they even have more depth in the minor leagues for that. Yeah, they've had Bobby Miller come up this year. Um, of course, they're Emmett missing. Emmett Shaheen came from straight from double-A. Every year. I think that's getting more popular that guys are – I mean, Brian Wu came from Seattle, came straight from double-A. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's getting to be more and more popular because double-A is the test and triple-A is those quad-A players that just right. can't make it. Right. Yeah. Quick. Clayton Kershaw. Career ERA. We talked about it a couple weeks ago, but I still want to test you. Career ERA? Yeah. I'm going to say it's a 323. 3. 2.48. Flu. 2.48. Yeah. The only oh reason I brought that gosh. up is because I was listening to the Compound podcast earlier. In his career, his rookie year, 4.26 ERA. Since then, he's only had two other seasons over three. 
in 2019, 3.03, and in 2021, 3.55. I mean, yeah. in that guy's younger days, that dude was the pitcher. The pitcher. Yeah, he was 20, just elite. He, 20, he was, 2013, playoffs, 1.83. 2014, 1.77. 2015, bad year, 2.13. <laughs> 2016, the year that Jake Arrieta won the Cy Young, 1.69. And I believe he was the runner-up. You, you go, go a couple more years. A few more years. You have it? 2.31, then 2.73, 17 and 18. So those are those last two are like the juice ball era still? Yeah. That's that's great. No, that's that not, that, right not great. That's players. incredible. A 2.31? Yes. Yeah. Was when, it, guys uh, were, when everybody and their mom was hitting 40 home runs? Yeah. Or did he, I don't, did he win the Cy Young in 2016? I know that was Max Scherzer. Wow. Because... Arietta won it in... 15. 15. Yeah. And I think John Lester was part of the the finalists in one of those two years. Let's not get too far deep in the weeds there. Want to touch on the Reds again. The Reds continue to win. They're winning tonight as I look at it. 9-2 to two versus the Washington Nationals. This team continues to just win games. Coming into tonight, they'd won 18 out of 22. They had an incredible month of June. They're up in the NL Central over the Brewers one game, but 40, 47 and 39 coming into tonight. They're eight games above 500. Their run differential is still minus 15, and the Cubs is plus 23. How ridiculous is that? They, they just don't have anybody to stop runs coming across the board. They've got Andrew Abbott, who has looked at I mean, incredible his time up. Here. Yes. It's, it's been five, six starts, but the guy is looking fantastic. And that's it. That's all they they really have. Yeah. Well, Can you give me a second guy. Well, that you would count on. If he was healthy, I would tell you Hunter Green. Right. Right. Uh, and then Nick Lodolo, who are both out on injury, and that's why I say the biggest need is a starter. Yeah. Andrew Abbott, six starts, one point two one ERA, four and zero. He's got forty two strikeouts in thirty seven point one innings. He's got a zero point eight eight WHIP. Would they be interested in Max Serger? I don't think they'll pay for it. I mean, he'll pay. He'll be more than the damn staff in the entire team. Yeah, Joey well, Votto is for, twenty-five million or whatever. He's got a player option, is all Serger has, because he could be gone after this year. I, he's going to take the player option. Another forty-three million guaranteed money. Oh, for sure. That's bad. That's, that's true. Do you see him making more than forty-three over the next three years after this year? I don't think so. He's going to definitely take the player option. I don't think the Reds will. The Reds are going to trade for, you know, who would be a good fit would be Cookie Carrasco from the uh, Mets, a veteran three or four starter. I just don't know if the Reds are going to pay the money for a number one type of pitcher. Right. You don't need a three. You, they need playoff game type pitchers. Right. And I don't, don't know that, that Cookie's that guy. Yeah. Right. I don't know that Cookie's that guy. But he's a veteran. That's what they don't have in that rotation. If you look at it, they're all young pitchers. The oldest guy they have is Luke Weaver. Oh, and he gets he's their fi- all over the place. He's their fifth starter. And last night he did shut down the Nationals. But other than that, like, we'll have to, as we get closer to the end of July, we'll, we'll have to do some more who who's on the market, who looks like where they could fit I, here and there. I love, I love the month of July for baseball. It's, yeah. I love the MLB draft. I love and that's I, next I week. Following that, that's the Sunday, I think. July is it 9th. Sunday? Oh, when we're not even going to be able to talk about that, man. We, there's so much to talk about. Get ready for a hot month of July here on the podcast. Uh, but the Reds, awesome baseball. The Phillies continue to play awesome baseball. They just won their tenth in a row yesterday on the road. They're seven and three in their last ten. They are forty six and thirty nine. That would be a half game out of the NL Central. How many games back of the Braves are they? 18? 11. the Mets. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So the Phillies are now a plus 12 run differential. I think they beat the Rays yesterday, right? And they beat the Rays I would, today. I, I'd to pull four. up my, micro, my, uh, my internet, but Microsoft Edge seems to be just taking all of my memory of the computer. I've got something going on. I need to download Chrome, like you said. Yeah. You got to download Chrome, buddy. Not a, not a free ad, though. No free ads. But Donald oh. Crumb. Uh, yeah, Phillies have won two in a row versus Tampa, um, who have not been playing 
great baseball. I told you they were going to start come back to earth. If only the freaking Orioles would play like they were earlier, they'd still be closer. They're five and a half back still. They've only gone four and six in their last ten. The Phillies having a great resurgence year by Nick Castellanos. He's hitting three sixteen ish. So Nick Castellanos, book it. He's going to hit. There's a double header later on this year, and he's going to hit a home run in both of those games. You know why? A, a great American? No, it's September 11th. Oh, because they're going to be talking about like September 11th. Yeah, and, and it's in just going to be that Nick conversation. Castellanos. That's going to be. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> but For sure. Even the Marlins would have won two in a row after losing three in a row to the Braves, and they are still eight games back in that division. So some good playing, uh, some good baseball being out of the NL teams, the AL teams, the Houston Astros, eight and two in their last 10, winning four in a row. They're resurgent towards the Rangers. They're only two games back at Texas. Um, It's going to be a fun couple of months. We're getting to that point. This is where the movers start to move, right? This is where those teams that were struggling at the beginning of the year, this is where you start to make your comeback. If you don't see who's the real deal. Well, right. And you got to position yourself to either be a buyer or a seller. Um, And I think that there are a couple teams probably guaranteed to sell at this point. Uh, I would say the Royals, probably the Tigers, and that's it in the American League. But I think you're looking at the Mets, uh, Padres, even the Cardinals. The Cardinals are now all of a sudden 11 and a half back. Um, I don't know if the Cubs are sellers or buyers Cubs, right yeah. now, though. I think the next two weeks you're going to find out. So what I read today, why they won't they sh- won't be major sellers, There's a, they already are reaching roster limits for most of their prospects that they have. The Cubs have so much... They don't have elite prospects, but they have near elite prospects, and they don't have the roster room for it. Right. You've only got five or six minor league teams that you've got to fill, and most of those rosters are full. And we're coming to prospect right. season where you're going to be drafting a couple here anyway. Right. So I don't think the Cubs are heavy. I don't think I, there's a point in selling at that point unless you're going to no. sell a piece that gets you a elite prospect, which no one's going to want to trade for rental. Right. Um, but the Nationals, the Colorado Rockies, and the Padres are the other teams. But we'll find out in the next couple of weeks. But do you think the – what would it take for the Padres and the Mets not to become sellers? Do you think the Mets are automatically sellers now, 18 back, seven games back in the wild card, or do you think that they could have a, a resurgence? I think they, they're only seven seven back. If you look at that 18 and a half, you're right. not winning the well, division. Right. Take that out of, the, out, of the, out of your book. The Padres are only seven six back. and a half back, though. Are they really? In the, the wild, wild card? card? Yeah. Oh, so that they're second spot or the leaderboard? Uh, the, the final second spot. Second spot. Yeah. That's, that doesn't really take you out. Juan Soto can get hot. Manny Machado is having a terrible year. Both those teams have the talent to do it. I think the Padres, of course, more than the Mets. The Mets, I think their, their year could be next year. They've got Beatty, Vientos, Ronnie Marcio. So that's the um, thing. The Mets could sell but still get better for next year real quick. And that's why the I think the idea that the Mets don't want to sell for prospects. They want to sell for near term buys like CES. Are not not constantly all see on strand. So you put this out on YouTube and on our Instagram page. Mets GM calls you up. You're the GM of the Diamondbacks. I will give you Max Scherzer for Brandon Fott. I Max Scherzer for Brandon Fott. I would probably do it. I think Fott has had a career year. He's so fastball heavy. He gets so many home runs hit off of him. Uh, I'll take it. Yeah. That's yeah. I, that's just the, when we were talking on the phone the other day, that was the team that popped up in my head. Is like I think the Diamondbacks could use one more good starting pitcher in that rotation, and then they definitely would be scary the rest of the way. And if Max Scherzer returns to Max Scherzer <laughs> – between him and Zach Allen, I don't care who your three or your four is at that point. You're winning two games. Imagine getting being Serger and getting out of that Mets environment a little bit where it's just so – it can't be Icky. healthy. Yeah. Well, and yes. I think that's the same with the Padres. I mean, look at the Reds team and then look at the Padres and the Mets. The Reds, as someone who lives here in Cincinnati, they're tight-knit. They're like – they're in Washington, D.C., that's where they were for 
4th of July yesterday. And as a team, basically, they're going to the Washington Mall to watch the fireworks. But I don't think the Mets or the Padres are friends like that. You're like you're not going to see them hanging out together. Also, they've that's they're what happens bought. when you they're all millionaires, multimillionaires too, right? Like they got their money, they're going to go do their own thing. They don't need each other to hang out with. I mean, yeah. Matt McLean, Spencer Steer just went 4 for 4 last night. Yeah. Um, Ellie De La Cruz. And they're all children. They're all children. Mhm. I mean, my buddy and I at work were talking about it yesterday. There's only three hitters on that team, I believe, that are outside of Joey Votto that are making more than a million dollars. And two of them are their backup catchers. Tyler Stevenson's their number one catcher, but Kirk Casale and Tyler Maley are their backup catchers, and they're both making like two and three million dollars. Tyler Stevenson's only making seven hundred and fifty thousand. And then the other player uh was uh, Kevin Newman. That's yeah. it. Yeah, now with the did you mention this of uh, if the Reds were to remove move a major league piece, it'd be Jonathan India? I think down the road. He's coming into, I believe, his arbitration year. I don't think they will. He's the captain of that team. He forever you want to say about Joey Votto. They call him Captain America because I don't know if you heard Jonathan India said the Reds are America's team a couple of weeks ago. Uh no. so yeah, they call him um Captain America here. Hold on a second. It just said encoding overloaded, but it flashed and then went away. So we're good. Um, three, two. So, I mean, they call him Captain America. If that could be one of those, as he gets towards where you need to pay him, we're probably sending him to the Dodgers to be a second baseman. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think he's going to be the glue on this team for the next year or two until you start to have to have a decision between Ellie, McLean, and India. And I think in the next year, year and a half, we're probably going to have an idea on that. But I don't think that they remove a huge piece from that team this year. Just with how gelled right. together they are. And speaking of pieces. That's how the Brewers messed up last year, sending Hader away. Yep. Yep. Uh, and speaking of pieces and a stud left-hander like Hader, Aroldis Chapman finally traded. First big move. Uh, you got that up on our Instagram page last week. Goes to the Rangers. What do you think of the deal? Uh, I, I love buying early. If you're going to be buying a guy and sending guys away, do it. I right. don't think they overpaid. They sent up. Mm-hmm. They they've got Jumar Rocker, Cole Wynn, uh, Jack Leiter. Mm-hmm. Not who who's on the Cubs. Mark, Mark Leiter. Leiter. Yeah, Jack Leiter. They've got pitching. This guy, he's going to give you quality starts, but he's not an, an ace of your future. They did not give up too much. Mm-hmm. If they they are going for it. Send what you need to, and you didn't have to give up any major pieces. I think it was a win. I totally agree. I think it was a win for the Rangers. They're in a win-now mode, right? You know you're going to win. You're competing. You're leading almost all of the AL in a lot of these categories. Go go secure that back half of the bullpen. And speaking of pitchers, we were talking about the ERA leaders earlier in the podcast. Uh, I want to touch on that again. I, some of these guys who haven't gotten their flowers – I mean, Bryce Elder, we talked about him, 2.45 ERA, second best in all of baseball. He's a rookie. Justin Steele pitching tonight, 2.43 coming into tonight. Now, the Brewers just scored two runs, so they've got three runs through six. So his ERA is up to 2.56, which would still put him sixth in the league. Justin Steele, amazing year. Do you think he could start the All-Star game? I was wondering that. I, I, I actually thought that news broke that he was starting the all-star game, but it was just the fact that he made yeah. the all-star team. Um, I think, yeah, just a left, lefty with who limits home runs like that. I think they just threw that stat up. Yeah. And he is not in the top three in home runs per nine. It's him, him uh, Sonny Gray, Mark, Sonny Gray, Justin Steele, and then Marcus Stroman in home runs per nine. Another name who, and this is not just the Cubs fan in me, but I don't think he's gotten a ton of praise nationally. Marcus Stroman is ninth on the list at 2.76 for an ERA, right? Like, And he was just right there at number one. He was just right He there. was just right there, and then the London game happened. But Which wasn't all his fault. No. So here's, here's the starter pitching 
for the NL All-Star team. Zach Allen, Spencer Strider, Bryce Elder, Justin Steele, Mitch Keller, Josiah Gray, Clayton Kershaw, and Marcus Stroman. No, Kershaw's out. Steele pitched tonight. That would be a normal rest almost if he pitched in the All-Star game next week. But Bryce Elder would be a good one. Strider, I mean, anybody on that list is a good one. But I think you could theoretically go with Steele or Stroman. You could, yeah. I think they have the better overall than than Strider, and I think having Strider come in after, I'm I'm rooting for the NL to win. Yeah, well, um, that hasn't happened since 2012. The last time that happened, uh, they won in Kansas City, nine straight for the AL. Do does AL win again, or is it going to be the uh, the NL finally coming through? What do you think? I'm very pessimistic about it, but I still think the NL can do it, baby. I mean, you look at the team, Ronald Acuna, Mookie Betts in the outfield. Who's that third one? In the outfield. Corbin Carroll. Corbin, Corbin Carroll, Carroll, yeah. Who is having an, and not only just a rookie of the year season, MVP type season, if it wasn't Ronald Acuna Jr. Mm-hmm. The, the NL is going to, where, where are they playing at in Seattle? Seattle. Uh, let's look. I'm still going to go for the NL, say the NL's got it and root for them. They, they, they're going to lose. Yeah. Just... Well, they're playing the Texas Rangers and the Tampa Bay Rays over in the uh, AL. <laughs> right. Well, the good thing going for the NL is Mike Trout and Aaron Judge are not playing in the game. So that means, and neither is Jordan Alvarez. So you're probably going to have Julio Rodriguez and Luis Robert. That's who I would start in the outfielders over them. Maybe Adelise Garcia. I don't know. But, man, um, it's going to be fun. Do you watch the All-Star Games typically? I did when I was younger. I, I may now that we have the podcast, to be honest. Right. Um, but I will i don't have cable. I'll have to watch it on M- MLB TV, and will they even stream it? I'd rather watch the Home Run Derby than the All-Star Game, especially with how they made the changes to the Home Run Derby in the last couple of years. That seems a lot more exciting, right? Where it used to be like, oh, my God, a four-hour event. I Is this watch. round over yet? Right. Okay, we get it. Where now it's timed. Yeah, yeah. now it's timed, and there's like the whole – you can't start until the hit, right? I'm, I'm more excited for the Home Run Derby, especially with how it's been the last couple of years. And they just released the – as we started the podcast, Michael, the brackets here. So Luis Robert is the number one seed going against Adley Rushman. Pete Alonzo, the number two seed, going against Julio Rodriguez, the seventh seed. Mookie Betts, the number three seed, versus Vlad Jr., the number six seed. And then the fourth seed, Adelise Garcia, going against Randy Orozarena in number five. Do you have a favorite out of this? Do you have a matchup that you're most excited for? Like who do you who do you think I, wins it? I'm excited for my predicted final, and I'm always wrong. <laughs> I just feel like I'm, I can never have things go my way, Brandon. I, I just can't have it. But my f- predicted final is Robert versus Vlad Jr. Ooh. That is, I think, the guys who can hit them. How about Luis feet. Robert? That's what I said. He said Robert. That's how you say it. <laughs> no, it's Robert. Oh. You sure? Yeah, go listen to the highlight we posted on YouTube yesterday. <laughs> the, the I could tell you that every week. Robert? Yeah, it's Luis Robert. I could have swore it was Robert. But it used to be Robert right. about two years ago, and then he came back and said, it's going to be Robert. But And he added the junior. Yes, and he added the junior. Um, At least so, it's not as bad as Mike, Mike Stanton and Goncarlo. That's just geez. ridiculous. Uh, here's what I have to say. You said Vlad Jr. versus Luis Robert. Yes. If you've listened to any of Michael's predictions in the past before, bet on anyone other than those two players. <laughs> <laughs> I think Robert beats Rushman. I think I think they did J-Rod dirty, putting him against Pete Alonzo. I don't think that's – well, they don't, they don't do it. It's just by order of home runs, isn't it? Uh, I guess you're right. That's how yeah. they always do it. It's I guess order you're of home right. runs is how they seed it. But – Man, so, J Rod, um, I think J Rod's going to make it to the finals. He's, who's he facing? I, I just Pete Alonzo. Pete Alonzo. But, but Alonzo's, Alonzo's got hurt. the hand problem, right? Yes, Alonzo's got the hand problem. I wouldn't be surprised if we're looking at a J Rod and Adelise Garcia final, and it's in Seattle. And I think J Rod, he was the runner up last year versus Juan Soto, and I think J Rod's kind of built for this kind of deal. 
I'm gonna go with. I have, a, I have him losing to Alonzo. I, I, so I'm gonna say J Rod, and you're gonna go with between Luis and Vlad. I'm going with uh, Robert. Oh, you're going with Robert. I was gonna say you're gonna go with the junior because <laughs> they're both juniors. But... I'm going with yeah. I'm going with R- Robert. So Michael goes with Luis Robert, and Brandon goes with. Do Julio you know? Robert. Do you know the last White Sox player to be in the home run derby? To be in the home run derby. Mm-hmm. I was going to guess Jim Tomey. So, so this is Robert, dang it, Luis Robert Jr. is the first player since 1995 for Frank the White Thomas. Sox to be in the home run derby when Frank Thomas won the home won it. Not only was in it, he won it. My favorite player growing up. And whenever we do the learn more about the the host of this podcast episode, uh, you'll find out about about that. We've been teasing that for almost a year. Coming up. Coming up soon. Coming up soon. That's called the tease. Real quick, speaking of tease, uh, let's talk about our top 10 power rankings. Uh, Real quick, we did record this earlier in the week, and that's where you're going to exclusively find this is on YouTube from now on. But... Uh, I want you to list your top 10 power rankings here, Michael, on who you had. Just real quick, we'll put the graphic here on YouTube, but if you want more in-depth on why, head on over to our YouTube page, youtube.com, at Barrels and Barrels Pod. Go. Yeah, so at the uh, at the top, I've got number 10, Cincinnati. Number 9, I've got the Miami Marlins. Number 8, I've got the Los Angeles Dodgers. 7, San Francisco Giants. Six, Houston Astros. Five, Baltimore. Four, Texas. Three, Arizona. Two, the Tampa Bay Rays. And one, the one and only Atlanta Braves. And I'm going to follow that up with my 10th team, the Miami Marlins. Nine is San Francisco Giants. Eight is the Philadelphia Phillies. Seven, the Houston Astros. Six, the Cincinnati Reds. Five, Baltimore Orioles. Four, Arizona Diamondbacks. Three, the Texas Rangers. Two, the Tampa Bay Rays. And then your number one team has been the number one team in baseball over the last two months or so, the Atlanta Braves. So that is our top ten. You just saw it here on YouTube, but if you want the full breakdown, it's just a 10-minute clip. Go check it out. We dive into each team. Just a quick little blurb on why they're in that position. It's right up on our YouTube page, and it's linked in our YouTube as well as on our podcast profiles. Wherever you stream us, it's down in the description below. But one more thing before we let our friends and family go. Michael, have you seen the game Immaculate? Let's go. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Have you seen the game Immaculate? Is that a movie? No, it's a new game on Twitter. It's like Wordle, but oh, the the grid, the grid. three by three. Yeah, the three by three. Yes, I have seen. Have it. you played I it yet? Played. I played it for the first time today, and I think we might want to start doing it together and posting it on our okay. on our podcast. But so like Wordle, like yeah, we used to do. Yeah, and the two of us used to Wordle. I still Wordle every day. Michael two of us used to hear. Uh, you still Wordle to this day? Yeah, I've Wordled. Let's see. I'll pull up my Wordle score. Uh, today I got it. In, uh, today I got my Wordle in um, in three. Today's was Venom. By the time this plays, it'll already been gone. Uh, but I'm playing for 435. I'm still at 100. percent But I'm on a one day streak because I missed yesterday because the Fourth of July. But uh, yeah, it was the Fourth of July. So Immaculate, for those of you still listening to our podcast, Barrels and Barrels, the Bourbon and Baseball podcast. Immaculate is it gives. They tweet out a grid, and it'll say Cubs, Orioles, and 300 average. And then on the other side, it'll be Mariners, Guardians, and MVP. And you have to make the grid line up to where the answer equals both. So if it was Cubs and Seattle for that column, you would have to pick a player who played for both the Cubs and the Mariners. If it was a Cubs 300, a player who hit 300 in a season for the Cubs, etc. So it's pretty cool. You only get nine guesses. So you've only got nine chances to be perfect. And if you get one wrong, you can't be perfect. Uh, and I got one wrong today. I, I guess Daniel Vogelbach for Cub in Seattle, but he never played. And that's another thing. You get a better score for how little percentage people have guessed your person, right? Like I. Oh, so today, like today, uh, Cubs, Orioles, who's your guy? I, I said Pedro Strope. 
and it was like 0.3 oh. 0.3 percent of people put that most people probably went jake arietta right I put Sammy Sosa, 16%. Oh, see, 16%. So then who did you put for Seattle in the Cubs? Mike Montgomery was my ultimate. I I just started it. You just just helped me I just helped Michael. But I think that that's a cool thing that we could play with our viewers and our listeners, as well as Michael and I. We could have our own little friendly competition here going forward. But I think it's kind of fun. It it gets the brain moving, too, uh, because you're trying to guess the, the less guessed answer that's correct. Like Freddie Bynum, right. would, Freddie Bynum would have been a great Cubs Orioles guess. Yeah. Or like Angel uh, Pagan with the the Cubs and the Mets, or something along those lines. Was that was that one of them too? I don't think so. Was, I was about to say I don't get to play today now. No, <laughs> you can play today, but it it gets tweeted out every night at midnight. So go check that out. We'll have to tweet it out from our barrels and barrels of bourbon and baseball. Uh, podcast twitter account which don't forget to follow us there at barrels and barrels we're on youtube at barrels and barrels pod instagram at barrels and barrels facebook at barrels and barrels pod as well as tiktok at barrels and barrels pod i think i effed up the instagram handle it's at barrels the letter n barrels pod email barrels and barrels at gmail.com if you want to ask for some t-shirts or for some glassware go ahead on over there but you can also buy t-shirts Charlie Mike, neverweekend.com. Just click on the shop tool there and you'll find our t shirt uh, in one of the sections. And also, please fill out that uh, glassware form on our link tree. We'd like to know which glasses you would like to get or buy from us. Uh, we're going to put in an order soon. Michael's got a Glen Karen. I've got a whis- Whiskey Wisdom glass in my hand. Both are great. We just want to know what you would be thinking and what one that you would want if we went down the glassware route. Don't forget, listen to us, Spotify, Apple, as well as Stitcher, Amazon. Well, Stitcher, as long as it's around Google and iHeartRadio podcasts. Please rate us and review us just like we rate and review our whiskey. And as you hear every week, we are genuine with our reviews. We're not bought by anybody. If we don't like something, we cut it. If we get something sent to us, we may cut it. We may put it on the DFA list. It's happened before. We don't love to do it, but... We're putting out our honest opinions, our honest thoughts, and we don't want to stray you, the listener or the viewer, uh, any way or direction. If I wouldn't want to buy it, I don't want to tell you to go out and buy it. Right. I I, I want it to be, hey, uh, Michael and Brandon said this was good. I know I can trust to spend my hard-earned dollar on it. Right. And Joseph Campbell just did that with the rabbit hole we did a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, that was pretty cool. So cool stuff there. Uh, That has been it for episode 32 of Barrels and Barrels, the bourbon and baseball podcast where we talk high proof and high heat. Episode 32, the Steve Carlton episode. Michael Burns, do you have any thoughts or final words for our friends, family, listeners, viewers, passerbys? Everybody's, yep. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go.